Section 34 of the story of King Arthur and his knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. The Book of Three Worthies, Part 2. The Story of Sir Pelias, Chapter 5th, Part 2. Now here a very untoward thing befell. To wit, it was this. The Lady Ettard had come to love that necklace of emeralds and of opal stones and of gold that she had borrowed from Sir Pelias, and that to such a degree that she never let it depart from her, whether by day or by night. Wherefore she wore it at that moment hanging about her neck and her throat. So, as she talked to Sir Gawain, he looked upon that necklace, and the enchantment thereof began to take a very great hold upon him. For he presently began to feel as though his heart was drawn with exceeding ardency out of his bosom, and unto the Lady Ettard, so much so that, in a little while, he could not at all keep his regard withdrawn from her. And the more he looked upon the necklace and the lady, the more did the enchantment of the jewel take hold upon his spirits. Accordingly, when the Lady Ettard spake so graciously unto him, he was very glad to accept of her kindness, Wherefore he said, gazing very ardently at her the whiles, Lady, thou art exceedingly gentle to extend so great a courtesy unto me. Wherefore I shall be glad beyond measure for to stay with thee for a short while. At these words the Lady Ettard was very greatly pleased, for she said to herself, Certes, this knight, albeit I know not who he may be, must be a champion of extraordinary prowess and of exalted achievement. Now if I can persuade him to remain in this castle as my champion, then shall I doubtless gain very great credit thereby, for I shall have one for to defend my rights, who must assuredly be the greatest knight in all the world. Wherefore she set forth every charm and grace of demeanour to please Sir Gawain, and Sir Gawain was altogether delighted by the kindness of her manner. Now Sir Engamore was there present at that time, wherefore he was very greatly troubled in spirit. For in the same degree that Sir Gawain received courtesy from the Lady Ettard, in that same degree Sir Engamore was cast down into great sorrow and distress, so much so that it was a pity for to see him. For Sir Engamore said to himself, Out four time ere these foreign knights came hitherward, the Lady Ettard was very kind to me, and was willing to take me for her champion and lord. But first came Sir Pelias, and overthrew me, and now cometh this strange knight, and overthroweth him. Wherefore, in the presence of such a great champion as this, I am come to be as nothing in her sight. So Sir Engamore withdrew himself from that place, and went unto his closet, where he sat himself down alone in great sorrow. Now the Lady Ettard had given command that a very noble and splendid feast should be prepared for Sir Gawain and for herself, and whilst it was preparing she and Sir Gawain walked together in the pleasaunce of the castle. For there was a very pleasant shade in the place, and flowers grew there in great abundance, and many birds sang very sweetly in among the blossoms of the trees. And as Sir Gawain and the lady walked thus together, the attendants stood at a little distance and regarded them, and they said to one another, Assuredly it would be a very good thing if the Lady Ettard would take this knight for her champion, and if he should stay here in Grant Menla for ever. So Sir Gawain and the lady walked together, talking very cheerfully until sunset, and at that time the supper was prepared, and they went in and sat down to it. And as they supped, a number of pages, very fair of face, played upon harps before them, and sundry damsels sang very sweetly in accord to that music, so that the bosom of Sir Gawain was greatly expanded with joy. Wherefore he said to himself, Why should I ever leave this place? Lo, I have been banished from King Arthur's court. Why then should I not establish here a court of mine own that might in time prove to be like to his for glory? And the Lady Ettard was so beautiful in his eyes that this seemed to him to be a wonderfully pleasant thought. Now turn we unto Sir Pelias. For after Sir Gawain had left him, the heart of Sir Pelias began to misgive him that he had not been wise. And at last he said to himself, Suppose that Sir Gawain should forget his duty to me when he meeteth the Lady Ettard, for it seems that haply she possesses some potent charm that might well draw the heart of Sir Gawain unto her. 
wherefore if sir gawaine should come within the circle of such enchantment as that he may forget his duty unto me and may transgress against the honour of his knighthood and the more that sir pellias thought of this the more troubled he grew in his mind so at last when evening had fallen he called an esquire unto him and he said go and fetch me hither the garb of a black friar for i would fain go into the castle of grant menla in disguise so the esquire went as he commanded and brought him such a garb and sir pellias clad himself therein now by that time the darkness had come entirely over the face of the earth so that it would not have been possible for any one to know sir pellias even if they had seen his face so he went unto the castle and they who were there thinking that he was a black friar as he appeared to be admitted him into the castle by the postern gate so as soon as sir pellias had come into the castle he began to make diligent inquiry concerning where he might find that knight who had come thither in the afternoon and those within the castle still thinking him to be a friar of black orders said unto him what would ye with that knight to the which sir pellias said i have a message for him they of the castle said ye cannot come at that knight just now for he is at supper with the lady ettard and he holds her in pleasant discourse at this sir pellias began to wax very angry for he greatly misliked the thought that sir gawaine should then make merry with the lady ettard so he said speaking very sternly i must presently have speech with that knight wherefore i bid ye to bring me unto him without delay then they of the castle said wait and we will see if that knight is willing to have you come to him so one of the attendants went unto that place where sir gawaine sat at supper with the lady ettard and he said sir knight there hath come hither a black friar who demandeth to have present speech with thee and he will not be denied but continually maketh that demand at this sir gawaine was greatly troubled in his conscience for he knew that he was not dealing honourably by sir pellias and he pondered whether or not this black friar might be a messenger from his friend but yet he could not see how he might deny such a messenger's speech with him so after a while thought he said fetch the black friar hither and let him deliver his message to me so sir pellias in the garb of a black friar was brought by the attendants into the outer room of that place where sir gawaine sat at supper with the lady but for a little time sir pellias did not enter the room but stood behind the curtain of the anteroom and looked upon them for he desired to make sure as to whether or no sir gawaine was true to him now everything in that room where the knight and the lady sat was bedight with extraordinary splendour and it was illuminated by a light of several score of waxen tapers that sent forth a most delightful perfume as they burned and as sir pellias stood behind the curtains he beheld sir gawaine and the lady ettard as they sat at the table together and he saw that they were filled with pleasure in the company of one another and he saw that sir gawaine and the lady quaffed wine out of the same chalice and that the cup was of gold and as he saw those two making merry with one another he was filled with great anger and indignation for he now perceived that sir gawaine had betrayed him so by and by he could contain himself no longer wherefore he took five steps into that room and stood before sir gawaine and the lady ettard and when they looked upon him in great surprise he cast back the hood from his face and they knew him then the lady ettard shrieked with great vehemence crying out i have been betrayed and sir gawaine sat altogether silent for he had not a single word to say either to the lady or to sir pellias then sir pellias came close to the lady ettard with such a fell countenance that she could not move for fear and when he had come nigh to her he catched that necklace of emeralds and opal stones and gold with such violence that he brake the clasp thereof and so plucked it from her neck then he said this is mine and thou hast no right to it and therewith he thrust it into his bosom then he turned upon sir gawaine where he sat and he said thou art false both unto thy knighthood and unto thy friendship for thou hast betrayed me utterly thereupon he raised his arm and smote sir gawaine upon the face with the back of his hand so violently that the mark of his fingers was left in red all across the cheek of sir gawaine then sir gawaine fell as pale as ashes and he cried out sir i have in sooth betrayed thee but thou hast offered such affront to me that our injury is equal to the which sir pellias made reply not so for the injury i gave to thee is only upon thy cheek but the injury thou gavest to me is upon my heart nevertheless i will answer unto thee for the affront i have done thee but thou also shalt answer unto me for the offence thou hast done unto me in that thou hast betrayed me then sir gawaine said i am willing to answer unto thee in full measure and sir pellias said thou shalt indeed do so thereupon he turned and left that place nor did he so much as look again either at sir gawaine or at the lady ettard 
But now that the Lady Ettard no longer had the magic collar about her neck, Sir Gawain felt nothing of the great enchantment that had aforetime drawn him so vehemently unto her. Accordingly he now suffered a misliking for her as great as that liking which had aforetime drawn him unto her. Wherefore he said to himself, How was it possible that for this lady I could have so betrayed my knighthood, and have done so much harm unto my friend? So he pushed back his chair very violently, and arose from that table with intent to leave her. But when the Lady Ettard saw his intent, she spake to him with very great anger, for she was very much affronted, in that he had deceived her when he said that he had overcome Sir Pelias. Wherefore she said with great heat, Thou mayest go, and I am very willing for it to have thee do so, for thou didst say false when thou didst tell me that thou hadst overcome Sir Pelias. For now I perceive that he is both a stronger and a nobler knight than thou, for he smote thee as though thou wert his servant, and thou yet bearest the marks of his fingers upon thy cheek. At this Sir Gawain was exceedingly wroth, and entirely filled with the shame of that which had befallen him. Wherefore he said, Lady, I think thou hast bewitched me to bring me to such a pass of dishonour. As for Sir Pelias, look forth into that meadow to-morrow, and see if I do not put a deeper mark upon him than ever he hath put upon me. Thereupon he left that place, and went down into the courtyard, and called upon the attendants who were there to, for to fetch him his horse. So they did as he commanded, and he straightway rode forth into the night. And he was very glad of the darkness of the night, for it appeared to him that it was easier to bear his shame in the darkness, wherefore when he had come to the glade of trees he would not enter the pavilion where his friends were. And also when Sir Ewan and Sir Marhaus came out unto him, and bade him to come in, he would not do so, but stayed without in the darkness. For he said unto himself, If I go in where is a light, Haply they will behold the mark of Sir Pelias, his hand upon my face. So he stayed without in the darkness, and bade them to go away and leave him alone. But when they had gone, he called his esquire unto him, and he said, Take this red armor off me, and carry it unto the pavilion of Sir Pelias, for I hate it. So the esquire did as Sir Gawain commanded, and Sir Gawain walked up and down for the entire night, greatly troubled in spirit and in heart. End of section 34《セクション35of the story of King Arthur and his knights。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The story of King Arthur and his knights by Howard Pyle, the Book of Three Worthies, Part Two, the Story of Sir Pelias, Chapter Sixth. Part One, How the Lady of the Lake Took Back Her Necklace from Sir Pelias. Now, when the next morning had come, Sir Gawain summoned his esquire unto him and said, Fetch hither my armor and case me in it. And the esquire did so. Then Sir Gawain said, Help me unto my horse. And the esquire did so. And the morning was still very early, with the grass all lustrous and sparkling with dew and the little birds singing with such vehemence that it might have caused any one great joy to be alive. Wherefore, when Sir Gawain was seated a horseback and in armour, he began to take more courage unto himself, and the dark vapours that had Willem overshadowed him lifted themselves a little. So he bespoke his esquire with stronger voice, saying, Take this glove of mine, and bear it to Sir Pelias, and tell him that Sir Gawain parades in the meadow in front of the castle, and that he there challenges Sir Pelias for to meet him a horse or a foot, howsoever that knight may choose. At these that esquire was very much astonished, for Sir Gawain and Sir Pelias had always been such close friends that there was hardly their like for friendship in all that land, wherefore their love for one another had become a byword with all men. But he held his peace concerning his thoughts, and only said, Wilt thou not eat food ere thou goest to battle? And Sir Gawain said, Nay, I will not eat until I have fought. Wherefore do thou go and do as I have bid thee. So Sir Gawain's esquire went to Sir Pelias in his pavilion, and he gave unto that knight the glove of Sir Gawain, and he delivered Sir Gawain's message to him. And Sir Pelias said, Tell thy master that I will come forth to meet him as soon as I have broken my fast. Now when the news of that challenge had come to the ears of Sir Brandiles and Sir Mador de la Porte, and Sir Ewan and Sir Marhaus, 
those knights were greatly disturbed thereat. And Sir Ewan said to the others, Messiahs, let us go and make inquiries concerning this business. So the four knights went to the white pavilion where Sir Pelias was breaking his fast. And when they had come into the presence of Sir Pelias, Sir Ewan said to him, What is this quarrel betwixt my kinsmen and thee? And Sir Pelias made reply, I will not tell thee, so let be and meddle not with it. Then Sir Ewan said, Wouldst thou do serious battle with thy friend? To which Sir Pelias said, He is a friend to me no longer. Then Sir Brandiles cried out, It is a great pity that a quarrel should lie betwixt such friends as thou and Sir Gawain. Wilt thou not let us make peace betwixt you? But Sir Pelias replied, Ye cannot make peace, for this quarrel cannot be stayed until it is ended. Then those knights saw that their words could be of no avail, and they went away and left Sir Pelias. So when Sir Pelias had broken his fast, he summoned an esquire named Montenoir, and he bade him case him in that red armor that he had worn for all this time, and Montenoir did so. Then, when Sir Pelias was clad in that armor, he rode forth into the meadow before the castle where Sir Gawain paraded. And when he had come thither, those four other knights came to him again, and besought him that he would let peace be made betwixt him and Sir Gawain. But Sir Pelias would not listen to them, and so they went away again and left him, and he rode forth into the field before the castle of Grant Menle. Now a great concourse of people had come down upon the castle walls for to behold that assault at arms, for news thereof had gone all about that place. And it had also come to be known that the knight that would do combat with Sir Pelias was that very famous royal knight hight Sir Gawain, the son of King Lot of Orkney and a nephew of King Arthur. Wherefore all the people were very desirous to behold so famous a knight do battle. Likewise the Lady Ettard came down to the walls and took her stand in a lesser tower that overlooked the field of battle. And when she had taken her stand at that place, she beheld that Sir Pelias wore that necklace of emeralds and opal stones and gold above his body armor, and her heart went out to him because of it. Wherefore she hoped that he might be the victor in that encounter. Then each knight took his station in such place as seemed to him to be fitting, and they dressed each his spear and his shield, and made him ready for the assault. Then, when they were in all ways prepared, Sir Marhaus gave the signal for the assault. Thereupon each knight instantly quitted that station which he held, dashing against the other with a speed of lightning, and with such fury that the earth thundered and shook beneath their horses' hooves. So they met fairly in the centre of the course, each knight striking the other in the very midst of his defences. And in that encounter the spear of Sir Gawain burst even to the handguard, but the spear of Sir Pelias held, so that Sir Gawain was cast out of his saddle with terrible violence, smiting the earth with such force that he rolled thrice over in the dust, and then lay altogether motionless as though bereft of life. At this all those people upon the walls shouted with a great voice, for it was an exceedingly noble assault at arms. Then the four knights who stood watching that encounter made all haste unto Sir Gawain where he lay, and Sir Pelias also rode back and sat his horse nigh at hand. Then Sir Ewan and Sir Gawain's esquire unlaced the helmet of Sir Gawain with all speed, and behold, his face was the color of ashes, and they could not see that he breathed. Thereupon Sir Marhaus said, I believe that thou hast slain this knight, Sir Pelias. And Sir Pelias said, Dost thou think so? Yea, quoth Sir Marhaus, and I deem it a great pity. Unto which Sir Pelias made reply, he hath not suffered more than he deserved. At these words Sir Ewan was filled with great indignation, wherefore he cried out, Sir Knight, I think that thou forgettest the quality of this knight. For not only is he a fellow companion of the round table, to whom thou hast vowed entire brotherhood, but he is also the son of a king, and the nephew of King Arthur himself. But to this Sir Pelias maintained a very steadfast countenance, and replied, I would not repent me of this were that knight a king in his own right, instead of the son of a king. Then Sir Ewan lifted up his voice with great indignation, crying out upon Sir Pelias, Be gone, or a great ill may befall thee. Well, said Sir Pelias, I will go. Upon this he turned his horse, and rode away from that place, and entered the woodland, and so was gone from their sight. Then those others present lifted up Sir Gawain, and bare him away unto the pavilion late of Sir Pelias, and there they laid him upon the couch of Sir Pelias. But it was above an hour ere he recovered himself again, 
and for a great part of that while those nigh unto him believed him to have been dead. But not one of those knights wist what was the case, to wit that Sir Pelias had been so sorely wounded in the side in that encounter that it was not to be hoped that he could live for more than that day. For though the spear of Sir Gawain had burst, and though Sir Pelias had overthrown him entirely, yet the head of Sir Gawain's spear had pierced the armor of Sir Pelias, and had entered his side, and had there broken off, so that of the iron of the spear the length of the breadth of a palm had remained in the body of Sir Pelias a little above the midriff. Wherefore, while Sir Pelias sat there talking so steadfastly unto those four knights, he was yet whiles in a great passion of pain, and the blood ran down into his armour in abundance. So what with the loss of the blood, and of the great agony which he suffered, the brain of Sir Pelias swam as light as a feather all the time that he held talk with those others. But he said not a word unto them concerning the grievous wound he had received, but rode away very proudly into the forest. But when he had come into the forest he could not forbear him any longer, but fell to groaning very sorely, crying out, Alas! Alas! I have certes got my death wound in this battle. Now it chanced that morn that the damsel Parthenet had ridden forth to fly a young gerfalcon, and a dwarf belonging to the Lady Ettard had ridden with her for company. So, as the damsel and the dwarf rode through a certain part of the forest skirt, not a very great distance from Grant Menla, where the thicker part of the woodland began, and the thinner part thereof ceased, the damsel heard a voice in the woodlands lamenting with very great dolor. So she stopped and hearkened, and by and by she heard that voice again making a great moan. Then Parsonet said to the dwarf, What is that I hear? Certes, it is the voice of someone in lamentation. Now let us go and see who it is that maketh such woeful moan. And the dwarf said, It shall be as thou sayest. So the damsel and the dwarf went a little way farther, and there they beheld a knight sitting upon a black horse beneath an oak tree. And that knight was clad altogether in red armor, wherefore Pasinet knew that it must be Sir Pelias. And she saw that Sir Pelias leaned with the butt of his spear upon the ground, and so upheld himself upon his horse, from which he would otherwise have fallen because of his great weakness, and all the while he made that great moan that Parsonet had heard. So, seeing him in this sorry condition, Parsonet was overcome with great pity, and she made haste to him, crying out, Alas, Sir Pelias, what ails thee? Then Sir Pelias looked at her, as though she were a great way removed from him, and because of the faintness of his soul he beheld her as it were through thin water. And he said very faintly, Maiden, I am sore hurt. Thereupon she said, How art thou hurt, Sir Pelias? And he replied, I have a grievous wound in my side, for a spear's point standeth therein nigh a palm's breadth deep, so that it reaches nearly to my heart, wherefore meseems that I shall not live for very long. Upon this the maiden cried out, Alas, alas, what is this? And she made great lament, and smote her hands together with sorrow that that noble knight should have come to so grievous an extremity. Then the dwarf that was with Parsonet, seeing how greatly she was distracted by sorrow, said, Damsel, I know of a certain place in this forest, albeit it is a considerable distance from this, where there dwelleth a certain very holy hermit, who is an extraordinarily skilful leech. Now when we may bring this knight unto the chapel where that hermit dwelleth, I believe that he may be greatly holpen unto health and ease again. Upon this Parsonet said, Ganseret, for Ganseret was the dwarf's name, Ganseret, let us take this knight unto that place as quickly as we are able, for I tell thee sooth when I say that I have a very great deal of love for him. Well, said the dwarf, I will show thee where that chapel is. So the dwarf took the horse of Sir Pelias by the bridle rein, and led the way through that forest and Parsonet rode beside Sir Pelias, and upheld him upon his saddle. For some while Sir Pelias fainted with sickness and with pain, so that he would else have fallen had she not upheld him. Thus they went forward very sorrowfully, and at so slow a pace that it was noontide ere they came to that certain very dense and lonely part of the forest where the hermit abided. And when they had come unto that place the dwarf said, Yonder, damsel, is the chapel whereof I spake. Then Parsonet lifted up her eyes, and she beheld where was a little woodland chapel built in among the leafy trees of the forest. And around this chapel was a little open lawn bedight with flowers, 
and nigh to the door of the hermitage was a fountain of water as clear as crystal. And this was a very secret and lonely place, and withal very silent and peaceful, for in front of the chapel they beheld a wild doe and her fawn browsing upon the tender grass and herbs without any fear of harm. And when the dwarf and the maiden and the wounded knight drew nigh, the doe and the fawn looked up with great wide eyes, and spread their large ears with wonder, yet fled not, fearing no harm, but by and by began their browsing again. Likewise, all about the chapel and the branches of the trees were great quantities of birds, singing and chirping very cheerfully, and those birds were waiting for their midday meal that the hermit was used to cast unto them. Now this was that same forest sanctuary, whereunto King Arthur had come that time when he had been so sorely wounded by Sir Pellinore, as hath been aforetold in this history. As the maiden and the dwarf and the wounded knight drew nigh to this chapel, a little bell began ringing very sweetly, so that the sound thereof echoed all through those quiet woodlands, for it was now the hour of noon. And Sir Pellias heard that bell as it were a great way off, and first he said, Whither am I come? And then he made shift to cross himself, and Parsonet crossed herself, and the dwarf kneeled down and crossed himself. Then when the bell had ceased ringing, the dwarf cried out in a loud voice, What ho, what ho, here is one needing help. Then the door of the sanctuary was opened, and there came forth from that place a very venerable man, with a long white beard, as it were, of finely carded wool. And lo, as he came forth, all those birds that waited there flew about him in great quantities, for they thought that he had come forth for to feed them. Wherefore the hermit was compelled to brush those small fowls away with his hands as he came unto where the three were stationed. And when he had come unto them, he demanded of them who they were, and why they had come thither with that wounded knight. So Parsonet told him how it was with them, and how they had found Sir Pellias so sorely wounded in the forest that morning, and had brought him hitherward. Then when the hermit had heard all of her story, he said, It is well, and I will take him in. So he took Sir Pellias into his cell, and when they had helped lay him upon the couch, Parsonet and the dwarf went their way homeward again. End of section 35 Section 36 of the Story of King Arthur and His Knights This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE STORY OF KING ARTHUR AND HIS KNIGHTS by Howard Pyle THE BOOK OF THREE WORTHIES PART TWO THE STORY OF SIR Pellias, CHAPTER SIXTH PART TWO After they had gone, the hermit examined the hurt of Sir Pellias, and Sir Pellias lay in a deep swoon, and the swoon was so deep that the hermit beheld that it was the death swoon, and that the knight was nigh to his end. So he said, this knight must assuredly die in a very little while, for I can do naught to save him. Wherefore he immediately quitted the side of Sir Pellias, and set about in haste to prepare the last sacrament, such as might be administered unto a noble knight who was dying. Now whilst the hermit was about this business, the door opened of a sudden, and there came into that place a very strange lady, clad all in green, and to be dight around the arms, with armlets of emeralds, and opal stones, inset into gold. And her hair, which was very soft, was entirely black, and was tied about with a cord of crimson ribbon. And the hermit beheld that her face was like to ivory for whiteness, and that her eyes were bright like unto jewels set into ivory, wherefore he knew that she was no ordinary mortal. And this lady went straight to Sir Pellias and leaned over him so that her breath touched his forehead, and she said, Alas, Sir Pellias, that thou shouldst lie so. Lady, said the hermit, thou mayest well say, Alas, for this knight hath only a few minutes to live. To this the lady said, Not so, thou holy man, for I tell thee that this knight shall have a long while yet to live. And when she had said this, she stooped and took from about his neck that necklace of emeralds and opal stones and gold that encircled it, and she hung it about her own neck. Now when the hermit beheld what she did, he said, Lady, what is this that thou doest, and why dost thou take that ornament from a dying man? But the lady made reply very tranquilly, I gave it unto him, wherefore I do but take back again what is mine own. But now I prithee let me be with this knight for a little while, 
for I have great hope that I may bring back life unto him again. Then the hermit was a doubt, and he said, Wilt thou endeavor to heal him by magic? And the lady said, If I do, it will not be by magic that is black. So the hermit was satisfied, and went away, and left the lady alone with Sir Pelias. Now when the lady was thus alone with the wounded knight, she immediately set about doing sundry very strange things. For first she brought forth a lodestone of great power and potency, and this she set to the wound. And lo, the iron of the spearhead came forth from the wound, and as it came, Sir Pelias groaned with great passion. And when the spear-point came forth, there burst out a great issue of blood, like to a fountain of crimson. But the lady immediately pressed a fragrant napkin of fine cambric linen to the wound, and stanched the blood, and it bled no more, for she held it within the veins by very potent spells of magic. So the blood being stanched in this wise, the lady brought forth from her bosom a small crystal phial filled with an elixir of blue color and of a very singular fragrance. And she poured some of this elixir between the cold and leaden lips of the knight, and when the elixir touched his lips, the life began to enter into his body once more. For in a little while he opened his eyes and gazed about him with a very strange look, and the first thing that he beheld was that lady, clad in green, who stood beside him. And she was so beautiful that he thought that haply he had died and was in paradise. Wherefore he said, Am I then dead? Nay, thou art not dead, said the lady. Yet hast thou been parsley nigh to death. Where then am I? said Sir Pelias. And she replied, Thou art in a deep part of the forest, and this is the cell of a saint-like hermit of the forest. At this Sir Pelias said, Who is it that hath brought me back to life? Upon this the lady smiled, and said, It was I. Now for a little while Sir Pelias lay very silent. Then by and by he spake and said, Lady, I feel very strangely. Yea, said the lady, that is because thou hast now a different life. Then Sir Pelias said, How is it with me? And the lady said, It is thus, that to bring thee back to life I gave thee to drink of a certain draught of an elixir vitae, so that thou art now only half as thou wert before. For if by the one half thou art mortal, by the other half thou art fay. Then Sir Pelias looked up, and beheld that the lady had about her neck the collar of emeralds and opal stones and gold which he had aforetime worn. And lo, his heart went out to her with exceeding ardor, and he said, Lady, thou sayest that I am half fay, and I do perceive that thou art altogether fay. Now I pray thee to let it be that henceforth I may abide nigh unto where thou art. And the lady said, It shall be as thou dost ask. For it was to that end I have suffered thee nearly to die, and then have brought thee back unto life again. Then Sir Pelias said, When may I go with thee? And she said, In a little, when thou hast had to drink. How may that be, said Sir Pelias, seeing that I am but yet like unto a little child for weakness? To the which the lady made reply, When thou hast drunk of water, thy strength shall return unto thee, and thou shalt be altogether well and whole again. So the Lady of the Lake went out, and presently returned, bearing in her hand an earthen crock filled with water from the fountain near at hand. And when Sir Pelias had drunk that water, he felt, of a sudden, his strength come altogether back to him. Yet he was not at all as he had been before, for now his body felt as light as air, and his soul was dilated with a pure joy such as he had never felt in his life before that time. Wherefore he immediately uprose from his couch of pain, and he said, Thou hast given life unto me again, now do I give that life unto thee for ever. Then the lady looked upon him and smiled with great loving kindness, and she said, Sir Pelias, I have held thee in tender regard ever since I beheld thee one day in thy young knighthood drink a draught of milk at a cottager's hut in this forest. For the day was warm, and thou hadst set aside thy helmet, and a young milkmaid, brown of face and with bare feet, came and brought thee a bowl of milk which same thou didst drink of with great appetite. That was the first time that I beheld thee, although thou didst not see me. Since that time I have had great friendship for all thy fellowship of King Arthur's court, and for King Arthur himself, all for thy sake. Then Sir Pelias said, Lady, wilt thou accept me for thy knight? And she said, I. 
Then Sir Pellias said, May I salute thee? And she said, Yea, if it pleasures thee. So Sir Pellias kissed her upon the lips, and so their troth was plighted. Now return we unto Parsonet and the dwarf. After those two had left that hermitage in the woodland, they betook their way again toward Grant Menle, and when they had come nigh out of the forest at a place not far from the glade of trees wherein those knights' companion had taken up their inn, they met one of those knights clad in half armor, and that knight was Sir Mador de la Porte. Then Parsonet called upon him by name, saying, Alas, Sir Mador, I have but this short time quitted a hermit's cell in the forest, where I left Sir Pellias sorely wounded to death, so I fear me he hath only a little while to live. Then Sir Mador de la Porte cried out, Ha, maiden, what is this thou tellest me? That is a very hard thing to believe, for when Sir Pellias quitted us this morn, he gave no sign of wound or disease of any sort. But Parsonet replied, Nevertheless, I myself beheld him lying in great pain and dole, and ere he swooned his death swoon, he himself told me that he had the iron of a spear in his side. Then Sir Mador de la Porte said, Alas, alas, that is sorry news. Now, damsel, by thy leave and grace, I will leave thee and hasten to my companions to tell them this news. And Parsonet said, I prithee do so. So Sir Mador de la Porte made haste to the pavilion where were his companions, and he told them the news that he had heard. Now at this time Sir Gawain was altogether recovered from the violent overthrow he had suffered that morning. Wherefore, when he heard the news that Sir Mador de la Porte brought to him, he smote his hands together and cried out aloud, Woe is me! What have I done? For first I betrayed my friend, and now I have slain him. Now I will go forth straightway to find him, and to crave his forgiveness ere he die. But Sir Ewan said, What is this that thou wouldst do? Thou art not yet fit to undertake any journey. Sir Gawain said, I care not, for I am determined to go and find my friend. Nor would he suffer any of his companions to accompany him. But when he had summoned his esquire to bring him his horse, he mounted thereon and rode away into the forest alone, betaking his way to the westward, and lamenting with great sorrow as he journeyed forward. Now when the afternoon had fallen very late, so that the sun was sloping to its setting, and the light fell as red as fire through the forest leaves, Sir Gawain came to that hermit's cell where it stood in the silent and solitary part of the forest woodland. And he beheld that the hermit was outside of his cell, digging in a little garden of lintels. So when the hermit saw the armed knight come into that lawn all in the red light of the setting sun, he stopped digging and leaned upon his trowel. Then Sir Gawain drew nigh, and as he sat upon his horse, he told the holy man of the business whereon he had come. To this the hermit said, There came a lady hither several hours ago, and she was clad all in green, and was of a very singular appearance, so that it was easy to see that she was fay. And by means of certain charms of magic that lady cured thy friend, and after she had healed him, the two rode away into the forest together. Then Sir Gawain was very much amazed, and he said, This is a very strange thing that thou tellest me, that a knight who is dying should be brought back to life again in so short a time, and should so suddenly ride forth from a bed of pain. Now I prithee tell me whither they went. The hermit said, They went to the westward. Whereupon, when Sir Gawain heard this, he said, I will follow them. So he rode away, and left the hermit gazing after him. And as he rode forward upon his way, the twilight began to fall apace, so that the woodlands after a while grew very dark and strange all around him. But as the darkness descended, a very singular miracle happened, for lo, there appeared before Sir Gawain a light of a pale blue color, and it went before him and showed him the way, and he followed it much marveling. Now after he had followed that light for a very long time, he came at last of a sudden to where the woodland ceased and where there was a wide open plain of very great extent. And this plain was all illuminated by a singular radiance, which was like that of a clear full moonlight, albeit no moon was shining at that time. And in that pale and silver light Sir Gawain could see everything with wonderful distinctness. Wherefore he beheld that he was in a plain covered all over with flowers of divers sorts, the odours whereof so filled the night that it appeared to press upon the bosom with a great pleasure. And he beheld that in front of him lay a great lake very wide and still, 
and all those things appeared so strange in that light that Sir Gawain wotted that he had come into a land of fairy. So he rode among tall flowers toward that lake in a sort of fear, for he wist not what was to befall him. Now as he drew near the lake he perceived a knight and a lady approaching him, and when they had come nigh he beheld that the knight was Sir Pelleas, and that his countenance was exceedingly strange. And he beheld that the lady was she whom he had aforetime seen all clad in green apparel when he had travelled in the forest of adventure with Sir Ewen and Sir Marhaus. Now when Sir Gawain first beheld Sir Pelleas he was filled with a great fear, for he thought it was a spirit that he saw. But when he perceived that Sir Pelleas was alive, there came into his bosom a joy as great as that fear had been. Wherefore he made haste toward Sir Pelleas, and when he had come near to Sir Pelleas, he leaped from off his horse, crying out, Forgive, forgive, with great vehemence of passion. Then he would have taken Sir Pelleas into his arms, but Sir Pelleas withdrew himself from the contact of Sir Gawain, though not with any violence of anger. And Sir Pelleas spake in a voice very thin, and of a silvery clearness, as though it came from a considerable distance. And he said, Touch me not. For I am not as I was aforetime, being not all human, but part fay. But concerning my forgiveness, I do forgive thee whatsoever injury I may have suffered at thy hands. And more than this I give unto thee my love, and I greatly hope for thy joy and happiness. But now I go away to leave thee, dear friend, and haply I shall not behold thee again. Wherefore I do leave this with thee as my last behest to wit that thou dost go back to King Arthur's court, and make thy peace with the queen, so thou mayest bring them news of all that hath happened unto me. Then Sir Gawain cried out in great sorrow, Whither wouldst thou go? And Sir Pelleas said, I shall go to yonder wonderful city of gold and azure, which lieth in yonder valley of flowers. Then Sir Gawain said, I see no city, but only a lake of water. Whereupon Sir Pelleas replied, Ne'ertheless there is a city yonder, and thither I go, wherefore I do now bid thee farewell. Then Sir Gawain looked into the face of Sir Pelleas, and beheld again that strange light that it was of a very singular appearance, for lo, it was white like to ivory, and his eyes shone like jewels set in ivory, and a smile lay upon his lips and grew neither more nor less, but always remained the same. For those who were of that sort had always that singular appearance, and smiled in that manner, to wit the Lady of the Lake, and Sir Pelleas, and Sir Launcelot of the Lake. Then Sir Pelleas and the Lady of the Lake turned and left Sir Gawain where he stood, and they went toward the lake, and they entered the lake, and when the feet of the horse of Sir Pelleas had touched the water of the lake, lo, Sir Pelleas was gone, and Sir Gawain beheld him no more, although he stood there for a long time, weeping with great passion. So endeth the story of Sir Pelleas. But Sir Gawain returned unto the court of King Arthur as he had promised Sir Pelleas to do, and he made his peace with Queen Guinevere. And thereafter, though the queen loved him not, yet there was a peace betwixt them. And Sir Gawain published these things to the court of King Arthur, and all men marvelled at what he told. And only twice thereafter, was Sir Pelleas ever seen of any of his aforetime companions. And Sir Marhaus was made a companion of the round table, and became one of the foremost knights thereof. And the Lady Ettard took Sir Engamore into favour again, and that summer they were wedded, and Sir Engamore became lord of Grant Menle. So endeth this story. End of section 36「Section 37 of the Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. The Book of Three Worthies, Part 3. The Story of Sir Gawain, Chapter 1st, Part 1. Part three The Story of Sir Gawain Here followeth the story of Sir Gawain and of how he discovered such wonderful faithfulness unto King Arthur, who was his lord, 
that I do not believe that the like of such faithfulness was ever seen before. For indeed, though Sir Gawain was at times very rough and harsh in his manner, and though he was always so plain-spoken that his words hid the gentle nature that lay within him, yet under this pride of manner was much courtesy, and at times he was so urbane of manner and so soft of speech that he was called by many the Knight of the Silver Tongue. So here ye shall read how his faithfulness unto King Arthur brought him such high reward that almost any one in all the world might envy him his great good fortune. Chapter First How a White Heart Appeared Before King Arthur, and how Sir Gawain and Geheris, his brother, went in pursuit thereof, and of what befell them in that quest. Upon a certain time, King Arthur, together with Queen Guinevere and all of his court, were making progression through that part of his kingdom which was not very near to Camelot. At this time the king journeyed in very great state, and Queen of Guinevere had her court about her, so there were many esquires and pages, wherefore what with knights, lords, and ladies in attendance, more than six score of people were with the king and queen. Now it chanced that at this time the season of the year was very warm, so that when the middle of the day had come the king commanded that a number of pavilions should be spread for their accommodation, wherein that they might rest there until the heat of the day had passed. So the attendants spread three pavilions in a pleasant glade upon the outskirts of the forest. When this had been done, the king gave command that the tables, whereat they were to eat their midday meal, should be spread beneath the shadow of that glade of trees, for there was a gentle wind blowing, and there were many birds singing, so that it was very pleasant to sit in the open air. Accordingly, the attendants of the court did as the king commanded, and the tables were set upon the grass beneath the shade, and the king and queen and all the lords and ladies of their courts sat down to that cheerful repast. Now whiles they sat there feasting with great content of spirit, and with much mirth and goodly talk among themselves, there came of a sudden a great outcry from the woodland that was near by, and therewith there burst forth from the cover of that leafy wilderness a very beautiful white heart, pursued by a white brachet of equal beauty. And there was not a hair upon either of these animals that was not as white as milk, and each wore about its neck a collar of gold, very beautiful to behold. The hound pursued the white heart with a very great outcry and bellowing, and the heart fled in the utmost terror. In this wise they ran thrice around the table where King Arthur and his court sat at meat, and twice in that chase the hound caught the heart and pinched it on its haunch, and therewith the heart leapt away, and all they who sat there observed that there was blood at two places upon its haunch where the hound had pinched it. But each time the heart escaped from the hound, and the hound followed after it with much outcry of yelling, so that King Arthur and Queen Guinevere and all their court were annoyed at the noise and tumult that those two creatures made. Then the hart fled away into the forest again by another path, and the hound pursued it, and both were gone. And the baying of the hound sounded more and more distant, as it ran away into the woodland. Now, ere the king and queen and their court had recovered from their astonishment at these things, there suddenly appeared at that part of the forest whence the hart and the hound had emerged, a knight and a lady, and the knight was a very lordly presence, and the lady was exceedingly beautiful. The knight was clad in half-armor, and the lady was clad in green, as though for the chase, and the knight rode upon a charger of dapple grey, and the lady upon a piebald palfrey. With them were two esquires, also clad for the chase. These, seeing the considerable company gathered there, paused as though in surprise, and whilst they stood so, there suddenly appeared another knight upon a black horse, clad in complete armor, and he seemed to be very angry, for he ran upon the half-armed knight and smote him so sorry a blow with his sword that the first knight fell down from his horse and lay upon the ground as though dead whereat the lady who was with him shrieked with great dolor. Then the full-armed knight upon the black horse ran to the lady and catched her, and he lifted her from her palfrey and laid her across the horn of his saddle, and thereupon he rode back into the forest again. The lady screamed with such vehemence of violent outcry that it was a great pity to hear her, but the knight paid no attention to her shrieking, but bore her away by main force into the forest. 
Then, after he and the lady had gone, the two esquires came, and lifted up the wounded knight upon his horse, and then they also went away into the forest, and were gone. All this King Arthur and his court beheld from a distance, and they were so far away that they could not stay that knight upon the black horse from doing what he did to carry away the lady into the forest, nor could they bring succour to that other knight in half-armour whom they had beheld struck down in that wise. So they were very greatly grieved at what they had beheld, and knew not what to think of it. Then King Arthur said to his court, Messires, is there not some one of you who will follow up this adventure, and discover what is the significance of that which we have seen, and compel that knight to tell why he behaved as he did? Upon this Sir Gawain said, Lord, I shall be very glad indeed to take upon me this adventure, if I have thy leave to do so. And King Arthur said, Thou hast my leave. Then Sir Gawain said, Lord, I would that thou would also let me take my younger brother, Gaheris, with me, as mine esquire in this undertaking. For he groweth apace unto manhood, and yet he hath never beheld any considerable adventure at arms. So King Arthur said, Thou hast my leave to take thy brother with thee. At this Gaheris was very glad, for he was of an adventurous spirit, wherefore the thought of going with his brother upon this quest gave him great pleasure. So they two went to the pavilion of Sir Gawain, and there Geheris aided Sir Gawain as his esquire to don his armor. Then they rode forth upon that quest which Sir Gawain had undertaken. Now they journeyed onward for a very considerable distance, following that direction which they had seen the hart take when it had sped away from before the hound, and when, from time to time, they would meet some of the forest folk, they would inquire of them whither had fled that white brachet and the white hart, and whither had fled the knight and the lady, and so they followed that adventure apace. By and by, after a long pass, it being far advanced in the afternoon, they were suddenly aware of a great uproar of conflict, as of a fierce battle in progress. So they followed this sound, and after a while they came to an open meadowland, with very fair and level sward. Here they beheld two knights fighting with great vehemence of passion, and with a very deadly purpose. Then Sir Gawain said, What is this? Let us go see. So he and Geheris rode forward to where those two knights were engaged, and as they approached, the two knights paused in their encounter, and rested upon their weapons. Then Sir Gawain said, Ha, Messiahs, what is to do, and why do ye fight with such passion, the one against the other in that wise? Then one of the knights said to Sir Gawain, Sir, this does not concern you. And the other said, Meddle not with us, for this battle is of our own choosing. Messiahs, said Sir Gawain, I would be very sorry to interfere in your quarrel, but I am in pursuit of a white heart and a white brachet that came this way, and also of a knight who hath carried off a lady upon the same pass. Now I would be greatly beholden to ye, if you would tell me if ye have seen aught of one or the other. Then that knight who had first spoken said, Sir, this is a very strange matter, for it was upon account of that very white heart and that brachet and of the knight and the lady that we two were just now engaged in that battle as thou didst behold. For the case is this. We two are two brothers, and we were riding together in great amity when that hart and that hound came hitherward. Then my brother said he very greatly hoped that the white hart would escape from the hound, and I said that I hoped that the hound would overtake the hart and bring it to earth. Then came that knight with that lady, his captive, and I said that I would follow that knight and rescue the lady and my brother said that he would undertake that adventure. Upon these points we fell into dispute, for it appeared to me that I felt a great affection for that hound, and my brother felt as extraordinary regard for the white heart, and that, as I had first spoken, I should have the right to follow that adventure. But my brother felt affection for the heart, and he considered that as he was the elder of us twain, he had the best right to the adventure. So we quarrelled, and by and by we fell to upon that fight, in which thou didst see us engaged. At this Sir Gawain was very greatly astonished, and he said, Messires, I cannot understand how so great a quarrel should have arisen from so small a dispute, and certes it is a great pity for two brothers to quarrel as ye have done, and to give one another such sore cuts and wounds as I perceive you have both received. Messires, said the second knight, I think thou art right, and I now find myself to be very much ashamed of that quarrel. And the other said, I too am sorry for what I have done. Then Sir Gawain said, Sirs, I would be very glad indeed, if you would tell me your names. And the one knight said, 
I am called Sir Sorlois of the forest. And the other said, I am called Sir Brian of the forest. Then Sir Sorlois said, Sir Knight, I would deem it a very great courtesy, if thou wouldst tell me who thou art. I would be very glad to do that, said Sir Gawain. And therewith he told them his name and condition. Now, when they heard who Sir Gawain was, those two knights were very greatly astonished and pleased, for no one in all the courts of chivalry was more famous than Sir Gawain, the son of King Lot of Orkney. Wherefore those two brothers said, It is certainly a great joy to us to meet so famous a knight as thou art, Sir Gawain. Then Sir Gawain said, Sir knights, that hart and that hound came only a short while ago to where King Arthur and Queen Guinevere and their courts of lords and ladies were at feast, and there, likewise, all we beheld that night seize upon the lady and make her captive. Wherefore, I and my brother have come forth upon command of King Arthur, for to discover what is the meaning of that which we beheld. Now I shall deem it a very great courtesy upon your part, if you will cease from this adventure, and will go in amity unto the court of the king, and will tell him of what ye beheld, and of how you quarrelled, and of how we met. For otherwise I myself will have to engage ye both, and that would be a great pity, for ye are weary with battle, and I am fresh. Then these two knights said, Sir, we will do as you desire, for we have no wish to have to do with so powerful a knight as you. Thereupon those two knights departed, and went to the court of King Arthur as Sir Gawain ordained. And Sir Gawain and his brother rode forward upon their adventure. Now, by and by, they came nigh to a great river, and there they beheld before them a single knight in full armor, who carried a spear in his hand, and a shield hanging to his saddle-bow. Thereupon Sir Gawain made haste forward, and he called aloud to the knight, and the knight paused and waited until Sir Gawain had overtaken him. And when Sir Gawain came up to that knight, he said, Sir knight, hast thou seen a white hart and a white hound pass by this way? And hast thou seen a knight bearing off a captive lady? Unto this the knight said, Yea, I beheld them both, and I am even now following after them with intent to discover whither they are bound. Then Sir Gawain said, Sir Knight, I bid thee not to follow this adventure farther, for I myself am set upon it. Wherefore I desire thee for to give it over, so that I may undertake it in thy stead. Sir, said the other knight, speaking with a very great deal of heat, I know not who thou art, nor do I care a very great deal. But touching the pursuance of this adventure, I do tell thee that I myself intend to follow it to the end, and so will I do. Let who will undertake to stay me. Thereupon Sir Gawain said, Messiah, thou shalt not go forward upon this adventure unless thou hast first to do with me. And the knight said, Sir, I am very willing for that. So each knight took such stand upon that field as appeared to him to be best, and each put himself into a posture of defense, and dressed his shield and his spear. Then when they were thus prepared in all ways, they immediately launched forth the one against the other, rushing together with great speed and with such an uproar that the ground trembled and shook beneath them. So they met together in the midst of the course, and the spear of the strange knight burst all into small pieces, but the spear of Sir Gawain held. Wherefore he hurled that knight out of his saddle with such violence that he smote the ground with a blow like an earthquake. Then Sir Gawain rode back to where his enemy was, for that knight was unable to arise. And he removed the helmet from the head of the fallen knight, and beheld that he was very young and comely. Now when the fresh air smote upon the knight's face, he presently awoke from his swoon, and came back unto his senses again. Whereupon Sir Gawain said, Dost thou yield unto me? And the knight said, I do so. Then Sir Gawain said, Who art thou? And the knight said, I am called Sir Allardin of the Isles. Very well, said Sir Gawain. Then I lay my command upon thee in this wise, that thou shalt go to the court of King Arthur, and deliver thyself to him as a captive of my prowess. And thou art to tell him all that thou knowest of the hart, and the hound, and the knight, and the lady, and thou shalt tell him all that hath befallen thee in this assault. End of section 37「Section 38 of the story of King Arthur and his knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daphne Ma. 
The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. The Book of Three Worthies, Part 3. The Story of Sir Gawain, Chapter 1, Part 2. So the knight said that he would do that, and thereupon they parted, the one party going the one way, and the other party going the other way. After that, Sir Gawain and his brother Gaheris rode a considerable distance, until they came by and by, through a woodland, into an open plain, and it was now about the time of sunset. And they beheld in the midst of the plain a very stately and noble castle, with five towers, and of very great strength. And right here they saw a sight that filled them with great sorrow, for they beheld the dead body of that white brasset lying beside the road like any carrion, and they saw that the hound was pierced through with three arrows, wherefore they wist that it had been slain very violently. Now when Sir Gawain beheld that beautiful hound lying dead in that wise, he was filled with great sorrow. What a pity it is! he cried, that this noble hound should be slain in this wise, for I think that it was the most beautiful hound that ever I saw in all my life. Here hath assuredly been great treachery against it, for it hath been foully dealt with because of that white heart which it pursued. Now I make my vow that if I can find that heart, I will slay it with mine own hands, because it was in that chase that this hound met its death. After that, they rode forward toward the castle, and as they drew nigh, lo, they beheld that white heart, with the golden collar browsing upon the meadows before the castle. Now, as soon as the white heart beheld those two strangers, it fled with great speed toward the castle, and it ran into the courtyard of the castle. And when Sir Gawain beheld the stag, he gave chase in pursuit of it with great speed, and Gaheris followed after his brother. So Sir Gawain pursued the white heart into the courtyard of the castle, and from thence it could not escape. Then Sir Gawain leaped him down from his horse, and drew his sword, and slew the heart with a single blow of his weapon. This he did in great haste, but when he had done that, and it was too late to mend it, he repented him of what he had done very sorely. Now, with all this tumult, there came out the lord and the lady of the castle, and the lord was one very haughty and noble aspect and the lady was extraordinarily graceful and very beautiful of appearance. Sir Gawain looked upon the lady, and he thought he had hardly ever seen so beautiful a dame, wherefore he was more sorry than ever that in his haste he had slain that white heart. But when the lady of the castle beheld the white heart that it lay dead upon the stone pavement of the courtyard, she smote her hands together and shrieked with such shrillness and strength that it pierced the ears to hear her, and she cried out, O oh, my white heart, art thou then dead? And wherewith she fell to weeping with great passion, and then Sir Gawain said, Lady, I am very sorry for what I have done, and I would that I could undo it. Then the lord of the castle said to Sir Gawain, Sir, didst thou slay that stag? Yeah, said Sir Gawain. Sir, said the lord of the castle, thou hast done very ill in this matter, and if thou wilt wait a little, I will take full vengeance upon thee. And to which Sir Gawain said, I will wait for thee as long as it shall please thee. Then the lord of the castle went into his chamber and clad himself in his armor, and in a little while he came out very fiercely. Sir, said Sir Gawain, what is thy quarrel with me? And the lord of the castle said, Because thou hast slain the white heart that was so dear to my lady. To the wit Sir Gawain said, I would not have slain the white heart, only that because of it the white brachette was so treacherously slain. 
Upon this the lord of the castle was more wroth than ever, and he ran at Sir Gawain and smote him unawares, so that he clave through the epaulier of his armour, and cut through the flesh, and unto the bone of the soldier, so that Sir Gawain was put to a great agony of pain at the stroke. Then Sir Gawain was filled with rage at the pain of the wound, wherefore he smote the knight so woeful a blow that he cut through his helmet and into the bone beneath, and thereupon the knight fell down upon his knees because of the fierceness of the blow, and he could not rise up again. Then Sir Gawain cut his helmet and rasped it off from his head. Upon this the knight said in a weak voice, sir knight i crave mercy of you and yield myself to you but sir gawain was very furious with anger because of the unexpected blow which he had received and because of the great agony of the wound wherefore he could not have mercy but lifted up his sword with intent to slay that knight then the lady of the castle beheld what Sir Gawain was intent to do, and she brake away from her damsels, and ran and flung herself upon the knight, so as to seal him with her own body. And in that moment Sir Gawain was striking, and could not stay his blow. Nevertheless he was able to turn his sword in his hand, so that the edge thereof did not smite the lady. But the flat of the sword struck her upon the neck a very grievous blow, and the blade cut her a little, so that the blood ran over her smooth white neck and over her kerchief. And with the violence of the blow the lady fell down and lay upon the ground as though she were dead now when sir gawain beheld that he thought that he had slain that lady in his haste and he was all adread at what he had done wherefore he cried woe is me what have i done alas said gaheris that was a very shameful blow that thou didst strike and the same of it is mine also because thou art my brother now i wish i had not come with thee to this place then sir gawain said to the lord of that castle sir i will spare thy life for i am very sorry for what i have done in my haste but the knight of the castle was filled with great bitterness because he thought that his lady was dead wherefore he cried out as in despair I will not now have thy mercy, for thou art a knight without mercy and without pity, and since thou hast slain my lady, who is dearer to me than my life, thou mayst slay me also, for that is the only service which thou canst now render me. But by now the damsels of the lady had come to her where she lay, and the chiefest of these cried out to the lord of the castle, ha sir thy lady is not dead but only in a swoon form which she will presently recover then when the lord of the castle heard that he fell to weeping in great measure from pure joy for now that he knew his lady was alive he could not contain himself for joy therewith sir gawain came to him and lifted him up from the ground where he was and kissed him upon the cheek then certain others came and bare the lady away into her chamber and there in a little while she recovered from that swoon and was but little the worse for the blow she had received that night sir gawain and his brother gaheris abided with the knight and the lady and when the knight learned who sir gawain was he felt it great honour to have so famous a knight in that place so they feasted together that evening in great amity now after they had refreshed themselves sir gawain said i beseech you sir to tell me what was the meaning of the white heart and the white brasset which led me into this adventure to this the lord of the castle whose name was sir albemore of the maurice said i will do so and therewith he spake as follows you must know sir that i have a brother who hath always been very dear to me and when i took this my lady unto wife he took her sister as his wife 
Now my brother dwelt in a castle nigh to this, and we held commerce together in great amity. But it befell upon a day that my lady and my brother's lady were riding through the forest together, discoursing very pleasantly. One time there appeared a lady unto them, exceedingly beautiful and of very strange appearance, for I do not think that either my lady or her sister ever beheld her like before. This strange lady brought unto those two ladies a white heart and a white brassette, and the heart and the hounds held each by a silver chain attached to a golden collar that encircled its neck. And the white heart she gave unto my lady, and the white brassette she gave unto my lady's sister. And then she went away, leaving them very glad. But their gladness did not last for very long, for ever since that time there hath been nothing else but discord between my brother and myself, and between my lady and her sister. For the white hound hath ever sought the white heart for to destroy it. Wherefore I and my lady have entertained very great offence against my brother and his lady, because they did not keep the white brassette at home. So it has come to pass that a number of times we have sought to destroy the hound, so that my brother and his lady have held equal offence against us. Now this day it chanced that was toward the outskirts of the forest to the east of us, when I heard a great outcry in the woodland, and by and by the white heart that belonged to my lady came fleeing through the woodland, and the white brassette that belonged to my brother's lady was in pursuit of it. And my brother and his lady and two esquires followed rapidly after the hut and the brassette. Then I was very greatly angered, for it seemed to me that they were chasing that white heart out of despite of my lady and myself, wherefore I followed after them with all speed. So I came upon them at the outskirts of the woodland, nigh to where there were a number of pavilions pitched in the shade of a glade of trees in the midst of the meadow, and there, in my anger, I struck my brother a great blow, so that I smote him down from his horse. And I cast his lady, and I threw her across the horn of my saddle, and I bore her away to this castle, and here I have held her out of revenge, because they pursued the white heart which belonged to my lady. For my lady loved that heart, as he loved nothing else in the world, except in myself. Sir, said Sir Gawain, this is a very strange matter. Now I beseech thee to tell me of what appearance was the lady who gave the white heart and the white hound unto those two ladies. Messiah, said the knight, she was clad all in crimson, and about her throat and arms were a great many ornaments of gold beset, with stones of diverse colours, and her hair was red like gold, was a man in a net of gold, and her eyes were very black and sown with exceeding brightness, and her lips were like coral, so that she possessed a very strange appearance. Ha! said Sir Gawain. From this description, methinks the lady should have been none other than the sorceress Vivienne. For now she spendeth all her time in doing such mischief as this by means of her enchantment out of pure despite. And indeed I think it would be a very good thing if she were put out of this world so that she could do no more such mischief. But tell me, Messiah, where now is that lady, thy wife's sister? Sir, said the knight, she is in the castle, and is a prisoner of honour. Well, quoth Sir Gawain, since now both the hart and the hound are dead, ye can assuredly bear no more enmity toward her and your brother. Wherefore, I do beseech you that you will let her go free, and will enter again into a condition of amity and good will the one with the other, in such a manner as hath a fall obtained between you. And the lord of the castle said, Sir, it shall be so. And so he set the lady free at the time, and thereafter there was amity between them, as Sir Gawain had ordained. And the next day Sir Gawain and his brother Gaheris returned unto this court of the king, and he told King Arthur and his court all that had befallen, hiding nothing from them. 
now queen guinevere was very much displeased when she heard how sir gawain saw no mercy to that knight and how he had struck the lady with his sword wherefore she said aside to one of those who stood nigh to her it seems to me a very strange thing for a belted knight to do to refuse to give mercy unto a fallen enemy and to strike a lady with his sword for i should think that any sword that had drawn blood from a lady in such wise would be dishonoured for i and i cannot think that any one who would strike a lady in that wise would hold himself guiltless unto his vow of knighthood this sir gawain overheard and he was exceedingly wroth thereat but he concealed his anger at the time only after he had gone away he said to gaheris his brother i believe that the lady hateth me with all her heart but some time i will show to her that i have in me more courtesy and i am more gentle than she believes me to be as for my sword since she deemeth to be dishonoured by that blow i will not use it any more so he took the sword out of its sheath and brake it across his knee and flung it away now all this hath been told to set forth that which follows for there ye shall learn what great things of nobility sir gawain could do when it behooved him to do them for haply ye who have read this story may feel as queen guinevere did that sir gawain was not rightwise courteous as a belted knight should have been in that adventure aforetold End of section thirty eight recording by daphne ma section thirty nine of the story of king arthur and his knights this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by adam perkins the story of king arthur and his knights by howard pyle chapter second how king arthur became lost in the forest and how he fell into a very singular adventure in a castle unto which he came now it befell upon a time some while after this that king arthur was at tintagalon upon certain affairs of state and queen guinevere and her court and the king's court made progression from camelot unto carleon and there they abided until the king should be through his business at tintagalon and should join them at carleon now that time was the spring of the year and all things were very jolly and gay wherefore king arthur became possessed with a great desire for adventure so he called unto him a certain favourite esquire hight boisengard and he said to him boisengard this day is so pleasant that i hardly know how i may contain myself because of the joy i take in it for it seems to be that my heart is nigh ready to burst with a great pleasure of desiring so I am of a mind to go a gadding with only thee for companion. To this Boisengard said, Lord, I know of nothing that would give to me a greater pleasure than that. So King Arthur said, Very well, let us then go away from this place in such a manner that no one will be aware of our departure. And so we will go to Carleon and surprise the queen by coming unexpectedly to that place so boisengard brought armour without device and he clad the king in that armour and then they two rode forth together and no one wist that they had left the castle and when they came forth into the fields king arthur whistled and sang and jested and laughed and made himself merry for he was as a war-horse turned forth upon the grass that taketh glory in the sunshine and the warm air and becometh like unto a colt again so by and by they came into the forest and rode that way with great content of spirit and they took this path and they took that path for no reason but because the day was so gay and jolly so by and by they lost their way in the mazes of the woodland and knew not where they were now when they found themselves to be lost in that wise they journeyed with more circumspection going first by this way and then by that but in no manner could they find their way out from their entanglement and so fell night time and they knew not where they were but all became very dark and obscure 
with the woodland full of strange and unusual sounds around about them. Then King Arthur said, Boisengard, this is a very perplexing pass, and I do not know how we shall find lodging for this night. To this Boisengard said, Lord, if I have thy permission to do so, I will climb one of these trees, and see if I can discover any sign of habitation in this wilderness. And King Arthur said, Do so, I pray thee. So Boisengard climbed a very tall tree, and from the top of the tree he beheld a light a great distance away, and he said, Lord, I see a light in that direction. And therewith he came down from the tree again. So King Arthur and Boisengard went in the direction that Boisengard had beheld the light, and by and by they came out of the forest and into an open place where they beheld a very great castle with several tall towers, very grim and forbidding of appearance. And it was from this castle that the light had appeared that Boisengard had seen. So they too rode up to the castle, and Boisengard called aloud and smote upon the gate of the castle. Then immediately there came a porter, and demanded of them what they would have. Unto him Boisengard said, Sirrah, we would come into lodge for to-night, for we are a-weary. So the porter said, Who are you? Speaking very roughly and rudely to them, for he could not see of what condition they were because of the darkness. Then Boisengard said, this is a knight of very good quality, and I am his esquire, and we have lost our way in the forest, and now we come hither seeking shelter. Sir, said the porter, if ye know what is good for you, ye will sleep in the forest rather than come into this place, for this is no very good retreat for errant knights to shelter themselves. Upon this King Arthur bespake the porter, for that which the porter said aroused great curiosity within him. So he said, Nay, we will not go away from here, and we demand to lodge here for this night. Then the porter said, Very well, ye may come in. And thereupon he opened the gate, and they rode into the courtyard of that castle. Now at the noise of their coming there appeared a great many lights within the castle, and there came running forth diverse attendants. Some of these aided King Arthur and Boisengard to dismount, and others took the horses, and others again brought basins of water for them to wash withal. And after they had washed their faces and hands, other attendants brought them into the castle. Now as they came into the castle, they were aware of a great noise of very many people talking and laughing together, with the sound of singing and of harping. And so they came into the hall of the castle, and beheld that it was lighted with a great number of candles and tapers and torches. Here they found a multitude of people gathered at a table, spread for a feast, and at the head of the table there sat a knight, well advanced in years, and with hair and beard white as milk. Yet he was exceedingly strong and sturdy of frame, having shoulders of wonderful broadness and a great girth of chest. This knight was of a very stern and forbidding appearance, and was clad altogether in black, and he wore around his neck a chain of gold with a locket of gold hanging pendant from it. Now when this knight beheld King Arthur and Boisengard come into the hall, he called aloud to them in a very great voice, bidding them to come and sit with him at the head of the table. And they did so, and those at the head of the table made place for them, and thus they sat there beside the knight. Now King Arthur and Boisengard were exceedingly hungry, wherefore they ate with great appetite and made joy of the entertainment which they received, and meantime the knight held them in very pleasant discourse, talking to them of such things as would give them the most entertainment. So after a while the feast was ended, and they ceased from eating. Then of a sudden the knight said to King Arthur, Messiah, thou art young and lusty of spirit, and I doubt not but thou hath a great heart within thee. What say you now to a little sport betwixt us two? Upon this King Arthur regarded that knight very steadily, and he believed that his face was not so old as it looked, for his eyes were exceedingly bright and shone like sparks of light. Wherefore he was a doubt, and he said, Sir, what sport would you have? Upon this the knight fell a-laughing in great measure, and he said, This is a very strange sport that I have in mind, for it is this. 
that thou and I shall prove the one unto the other what courage each of us may have. And King Arthur said, How shall we prove that? Whereunto the knight made reply, This is what we shall do. Thou and I shall stand forth in the middle of this hall, and thou shalt have leave to try to strike off my head. And if I can receive that blow without dying therefrom, then I shall have leave to strike thy head off in a like manner. Upon this speech, King Arthur was greatly adread, and he said, That is very strange sport for two men to engage upon. Now when King Arthur said this, all those who were in the hall burst out laughing beyond all measure, and as though they would never stint from their mirth. Then, when they had become in a measure quiet again, the knight of that castle said, Sir, art thou afraid of that sport? Upon which King Arthur fell very angry, and he said, Nay, I am not afeard, for no man hath ever yet had reason to say that I showed myself afeard of any one. Very well, said the knight of the castle, then let us try that sport of which I spake. And King Arthur said, I am willing. Then Boisenard came to King Arthur where he was, and he said, Lord, do not thou enter into this thing, but rather let me undertake this venture in thy stead, for I am assured that some great treachery is meditated against thee. But King Arthur said, Nay, no man shall take my danger upon himself, but I will assume mine own danger without calling upon any man to take it. So he said to the knight of the castle, Sir, I am ready for that sport of which thou didst speak, but who is to strike that first blow, and how shall we draw lots therefore? Messiah, said the knight of the castle, there shall be no lots drawn, for as thou art the guest of this place, so shall thou have first assay at that sport. Therewith that knight arose and laid aside his black robe, and he was clad beneath in a shirt of fine linen, very cunningly worked, and he wore hosen of crimson. Then he opened that linen undergarment at the throat, and he turned down the collar thereof so as to lay his neck bare to the blow. Thereupon he said, Now, sir knight, thou shalt have to strike well if thou wouldst win at this sport. But King Arthur showed no dread of that undertaking, for he arose and drew Excalibur so that the blade of the sword flashed with exceeding brightness. Then he measured his distance and lifted the sword, and he smote the knight of the castle with all his might upon the neck. And lo, the blade cut through the neck of the knight of the castle with wonderful ease, so that the head flew from the body to a great distance away. But the trunk of the body of that knight did not fall, but instead of that it stood and it walked to where the head lay, and the hands of the trunk picked up the head, and they set the head back upon the body, and lo, that knight was as sound and whole as ever he had been in all his life. Upon this all those of the castle shouted and made great mirth, and they called upon King Arthur that it was now his turn to try that sport. So the king prepared himself, laying aside his surcoat and opening his undergarment at the throat, as the knight of the castle had done, and at that Boisenard made great lamentation. Then the knight of the castle said, Sir, art thou afeard? And King Arthur said, No, I am not afeard, for every man must come to his death some time, and it appears that my time hath now come, and that I am to lay down my life in this foolish fashion for no fault of mine own. Then the knight of the castle said, Well, stand thou away a little distance, so that I may not strike thee too close, and so lose the virtue of my blow. So King Arthur stood forth in the midst of the hall, and the knight of the castle swung his sword several times, but did not strike. Likewise he several times laid the blade of the sword upon King Arthur's neck, and it was very cold. Then King Arthur cried out in great passion, Sir, it is thy right to strike, but I beseech thee not to torment me in this manner. Nay, said the knight of the castle, it is my right to strike when it pleases me, and I will not strike any before that time. For if it please me, I will torment thee for a great while ere I slay thee. 
so he laid his sword several times more upon king arthur's neck and king arthur said no more but bore that torment with a very steadfast spirit then the knight of the castle said thou appearest to be a very courageous and honorable knight and i have a mind to make a covenant with thee and king arthur said what is that covenant it is this said the knight of the castle i will spare thee thy life for a year and a day if thou wilt pledge me thy knightly word to return hither at the end of that time then king arthur said very well it shall be so and therewith he pledged his knightly word to return at the end of that time swearing to that pledge upon the cross of the hilt of excalibur then the knight of the castle said i will make another covenant with thee what is it said king arthur my second covenant is this quoth the knight of the castle i will give to thee a riddle and if thou wilt answer that riddle when thou returnest hither and if thou makest no mistake in that answer then will i spare thy life and set thee free and king arthur said what is that riddle to which the knight made reply the riddle is this what is it that a woman desires most of all in the world sir said king arthur i will seek to find the answer to that riddle and i give thee gramercy for sparing my life for so long a time as thou hast done and for giving me the chance to escape my death upon this the knight of the castle smiled very sourly and he said i do not offer this to thee because of mercy to thee but because i find pleasure in tormenting thee for what delight canst thou have in living thy life when thou knowest that thou must for a surety die at the end of one short year and what pleasure canst thou have in living even that year when thou shalt be tormented with anxiety to discover the answer to my riddle then king arthur said i think thou art very cruel and the knight said i am not denying that so that night king arthur and boisenard lay at the castle and the next day they took their way thence and king arthur was very heavy and troubled in spirit nay the less he charged boisenard that he should say nothing concerning that which had befallen but that he should keep it in secret and boisenard did as the king commanded and said nothing concerning that adventure now in that year which followed king arthur settled his affairs also he sought everywhere to find the answer to that riddle many there were who gave him answers in plenty for one said that a woman most desired wealth and another said she most desired beauty and one said she desired power to please and another said that she most desired fine raiment and one said this and another said that but no answer appeared to king arthur to be good and fitting for his purpose so the year passed by until only a fortnight remained and then king arthur could not abide to stay where he was any longer for it seemed to him his time was very near to hand and he was filled with a very bitter anxiety of soul wherefore he was very restless to be away so he called boisenard to him and he said boisenard help me to arm for i am going away then boisenard fell a weeping in very great measure and he said lord do not go at this king arthur looked very sternly at his esquire and said boisenard how is this wouldst thou tempt me to violate mine honour it is not very hard to die but it would be very bitter to live my life in dishonour wherefore tempt me no more but do my bidding and hold thy peace and if i do not return in a month from this time then mayest thou tell all that hath befallen and thou mayest tell sir constantine of cornwall that he is to search the papers in my cabinet and that there he will find all that is to be done should death overtake me so boisenard put a plain suit of armour upon king arthur though he could hardly see what he was about for the tears that flowed down out of his eyes in great abundance and he laced upon the armor of the king a surcoat without device and he gave the king a shield without device thereupon king arthur rode away without considering whither his way took him and of every one whom he met he inquired what that thing was that a woman most desired and no one could give him an answer that appeared to him to be what it should be wherefore he was in great doubt and torment of spirit now the day before king arthur was to keep his covenant at that castle 
he was wandering through the adjacent forest in great travail of soul, for he wist not what he should do to save his life. As he wandered so, he came of a sudden upon a small hut built up under an overhanging oak tree, so that it was very hard to tell where the oak tree ended and the hut began. And there were a great many large rocks all about covered with moss, so that the king might very easily have passed by the hut, only that he beheld a smoke to arise therefrom, as from a fire that burned within. So he went to the hut, and opened the door, and entered. At first he thought there was no one there, but when he looked again he beheld an old woman sitting bent over a small fire that burned upon the hearth. And King Arthur had never beheld such an ugly beldame as that one who sat there bending over that fire, for her ears were very huge and flapped, and her hair hung down over her head like two snakes, and her face was covered all over with wrinkles, so that there were not any places at all where there was not a wrinkle, and her eyes were bleared and covered over with a film, and the eyelids were red as with the continual weeping of her eyes, and she had but one tooth in her mouth, and her hands, which she spread out to the fire, were like claws of bone. Then King Arthur gave her greeting, and she gave the king greeting, and she said to him, My lord king, whence come ye, and why do you come to this place? Then King Arthur was greatly astonished that the old woman should know him, who he was, and he said, Who are you that appeareth to know me? No matter, said she, I am one who meaneth you well, so tell me what is the trouble that brings you here at this time? So the king confessed all his trouble to that old woman, and he asked her if she knew the answer to that riddle. What is it that a woman most desires? Yea, said the old woman, I know the answer to that riddle very well, but I will not tell it to thee unless thou wilt promise me something in return. At this King Arthur was filled with very great joy that the old woman should know the answer of that riddle, and he was filled with doubt of what she would demand of him. Wherefore he said, What is it thou must have in return for that answer? Then the old woman said, If I aid thee to guess thy riddle aright, thou must promise that I shall become wife unto one of the knights of thy court, whom I may choose when thou returnest homeward again. Ha! said King Arthur, how may I promise that upon the behalf of any one? Upon this the old woman said, are not the knights of thy court of such nobility that they will do that to save thee from death? I believe they are, said King Arthur, and with that he meditated a long while, saying unto himself, What will my kingdom do if I die at this time? I have no right to die. So he said to the old woman, Very well, I will make that promise. Then she said unto the king, This is the answer to that riddle. That which a woman most desires is to have her will. And the answer seemed to King Arthur to be altogether right. Then the old woman said, My lord king, thou hast been played upon by that knight who hath led thee into this trouble, for he is a great conjurer and a magician of a very evil sort. He carrieth his life not within his body, but in a crystal globe which he weareth in a locket hanging about his neck. Wherefore... It was that when thou didst cut the head from off his body, his life remained in that locket, and he did not die. But if thou hadst destroyed that locket, then he would immediately have died. I will mind me of that, said King Arthur. So King Arthur abided with that old woman for that night, and she refreshed him with meat and drink, and served him very well. And the next morning he set forth unto that castle where he had made his covenant, and his heart was more cheerful than it had been for a whole year. End of section 39. Recording by Adam Perkins.